Welcome to a masterclass in going from zero to one in private service as a chef. Today we have Philippa Smith, the founder of Silver Swan Recruitment, Patricia Friend, a luxury lifestyle manager and career coach, Peter Cole von Ryder, CEO of Estate Management Solutions. And this has been an inspiring conversation about how to make it coming as a highly skilled restaurant chef, going into the private service, how to navigate the first couple of interviews, how to position yourself, and how to make sure that you have the soft skills to actually show off your hard skills. Because without the soft skills, there is no landing in any private service position. This episode is brought to you by FultonFishMarket.com, the most trusted name in seafood. FultonFishMarket.com is the e-commerce provider for New York's iconic Fulton Fish Market, the largest seafood market in the Western Hemisphere, trusted by top chefs for over 200 years. Fulton Fish Market provides a range of world-class seafood options. FultonFishMarket.com can help you serve a wide range of customers, whether you serve high-profile individuals or just strive for culinary excellence. They deliver directly to your doorstep in all 48 contiguous states, providing a comprehensive selection of the finest seafood, from wild fish to caviar and shellfish. When it comes to seafood, FultonFishMarket.com is our go-to destination and the name we trust. Let's celebrate those who support us and dive into this episode of the Private Chef Podcast with a taste of excellence and freshness. Visit www.fultonfishmarket.com to get 15% of your first order. Use code PRIVATECHEF at checkout. Welcome to the Private Chef Podcast, serving the 1%. I'm your host, Hannes Hedgey. And on our show, we speak to the best chefs, how they honed in on their skills to excel in the industry and what it takes to work as a private chef for some of the most exclusive clients in the world. What would you tell a chef who is probably in his early mid-20s, highly skilled, you know, has his first seven to 10 years under his belt and is looking to get into the private service industry, basically going from zero in private to one, having a full-time position. Who wants to go first? Okay. Uh, so well, how does a chef, I get asked this all the time, how does a chef get into the industry when everybody wants him to have experience and he hasn't got any experience? So no one will give him experience because he hasn't got any experience. Yes. Um, he needs to get some experience, right? <laughs> basically but it is tricky so you're talking about are you saying your chef has got restaurant experience he wants to get into the private sector okay fab um okay so i think we've talked about this before the first thing he needs to do is start to compile a portfolio for himself of his work um, and i don't think restaurant chefs are very used to taking photos of their food i don't think they're used to writing their own menus i don't think they're used to writing their own menu plans etc so um i'd say in the run-up to transitioning Start documenting your food. Create yourself a separate Instagram account, which is purely for your work. Have a link to that Instagram account on your CV or resume. So when you're starting to apply, yes, you haven't worked as a private chef, but you can show what you can do as a private chef, first and foremost. And then it's a case of getting as much experience as you can. I don't think you... Don't get me wrong. Some chefs, if they're in the right place at the right time, can be offered their first permanent gig off the bat. If they are with a family who knows the restaurant that he works in, who knows a chef that he used to work with. So it's definitely not impossible, but it definitely is right place, right time, and normally through who you know. So I don't want to put people off completely. But other than that, I'd say anything, any opportunity you get to gain any kind of exposure to a private environment you take, find a friend who's a private chef and go and help them for free at any event he's doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go and offer, if he, uh, be an extra pair of hands, do you know what I mean? So even if you can then on, on your resume say, I've had six months where I've been like helping private chefs at various events, that will help. It's also really good exposure because a private chef could think they want to be, a, sorry, a chef may think they want to be a private chef. Go and help their mate out at some dinner party and think, sod this, the wife's <laughs> crazy, the kids are under my feet, the kitchen's not built by a chef. This is hell. And I've been working for 20 hours straight. So if nothing else, if for even, so even beyond gaining a bit of experience, I think that it's important for you to have a bit of exposure before right. you jump two feet into this industry. Yeah. Um, and obviously, once you get, and also when you then start getting a little bit of experience, it, you gain a bit of insight, you gain a bit of experience, but you start to gain some contacts. 
And it's gaining contacts that I think will really help you. The soon, soon you start to dip your toe a little bit in some of the private stuff, mm -hmm. generally doors become open because you're just starting to move in the right circles a little bit more. And you seem to be a bit more knowledgeable about what you're doing. Do you know what I mean? That would be, where, that'd be where I start. Yeah, I agree, Philippa. And the Instagram thing I'm a little uh, hesitant mm -hmm. on. There was a really, couple of really good LinkedIn posts, one by... Uh, uh, chef estate manager David Shoemaker mm. and the other one by mm. Daniel Wood, who uh, Woods, who unfortunately couldn't join us today. Um, there is a difference between chef, restaurant chef, personal chef, and private chef. I think the pri the personal chef route is a viable option for some people. If you if you don't know any private chefs that you can reach out to, being a personal chef, the distinction being I cook for one or two people in my own home or in a catering kitchen and then drop off meals is another pathway. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there, there are other ways of doing it. And then you might find a client or someone who goes, oh, I love what you do for you, for us. Can you do it for us full time? Because working in a restaurant and working in a private home are vastly different. Sometimes they're, they're equally equipped <laughs> in, you know, all the accoutrement and the ice cream makers and, and all the things that you need. But working in a stainless steel restaurant kitchen versus working in a highly appointed you know, fine finishes, fine furnishes, you know, finishes a uh, private home or it's different. There's a little bit of change that has to happen for that, especially when nine times of the 10, you're also the person to clean that kitchen when you're done with that meal. <laughs> There's not a separate group of people that come in and clean up behind you nine times out of 10. In some households, yes, but not in most of them. I think that, that speaks directly to what Philippa was saying mm -hmm. was you, you've got to stick your toes in the water. Yeah. You got to find out if this was really for you because... Unlike that professional kitchen, the chef has to make is the one that cleans up everything and makes sure everything is pristine before leaving for the day. That is the chef's job. The housekeepers are there for the family, not for the chef. The a couple of other things I've always noted in my career is that when you're making that transition, there's a couple of things that restaurant chefs are going to have to know as to one. You got to know how to cook a box of mac and cheese and dino nuggets mm -hmm. because the kids don't care that you can make this beautiful crafted mac and cheese. Mm -hmm. They want craft. And if that is below you, then you're not going to survive in our industry for very long because if that's what the kids want. That's what you got to make them. The other factor is that the the paradigm shift of the intimacy, because mm -hmm. when you're in a restaurant, you're serving hundreds of people potentially every night and you're making hundreds of dishes. So you don't have to really get to know the customers. So you've got a couple that, you know, so you have this major group of customers and each one of them, you have a little bit of intimate knowledge of, you may know their name, you may know a allergy or two if they come, come through all on a regular basis. In private service, reverse that. You've got a captive audience of two to four, five, six, depending on the family. And you have to know each one of them on a large, larger, more intimate scale and have to curate your menu to their tastes. Mm. It does, again, going back to the dino nuggets and the Kraft Mac and cheese, doesn't matter what your creative brain wants to make. If the principals don't want it, it's going to look like, you know, just, you know what, on a shingle that nobody wants to eat. That's actually worth m mentioning. I think some chefs, think that working as a private chef is amazing because you get to cook whatever you want you can go nuts now actually i know a lot of private chefs that find chef in the private industry boring because the wives eat lettuce and like there's a very very famous supermodel here in the uk and they burn through chefs because no chef will stay because it is the most boring job because you cannot be creative. You can know what I mean. Very minuscule, very plain, very basic. And actually, they'll have way more fun in the restaurant when they're mucking around with their mates, the camaraderie, creating dishes together, all the rest. And actually, they felt really, really restricted when they moved into the private sector than they did in the restaurant. That's not always the case. Sometimes you go to proper foodie families and you get to go nuts, which is brilliant. So I think it's really important when you're entering the private industry to really take your time and choose the family that's going to create, we're going to provide the environment of, to which you're looking for. You know what I mean? Yeah. Don't get me wrong. First job to first job, maybe take whatever. But I think 
yeah, I know people that have actually gone back to the restaurants because they just got bored of cooking. Then their husband, who's a foodie, is traveling. This is very stereotypical because sometimes the man travels a lot with work or the rest and they're stuck at home um, cooking for the kids that are very fussy and the wives are more fussy and they end up getting really bored. It's easy, yeah. but it can be really bored in some households. Yeah. In line with that is the whole team and HR building part of it, right? When you work in a private home, it's you. You work for the client, the employer, and the shareholder, right? There is no levels between you and the family. So if you're having a problem with someone, you're having a problem with the person who cuts the check, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's yeah. not like, oh, I make a uh, 100 meals and one person didn't like the execution of it. No, you're making one meal. And if one person doesn't like the execution of it, you, you may not be here much longer, right? So it's it's a different aspect. And there's usually no HR. There's no upper management, usually, depending on how the family structure is having the chef in the household. And it's you. You know, you're up. At, I've worked with, I'm not a chef. I've worked with great chefs um, as a household manager role. And, you know, they're up at the crack of dawn. They're in the supermarkets. They're shopping. They're banging out two, three meals a day. And it's them, just them in the kitchen. Mm. Beautifully appointed kitchen, maybe even a lovely catering kitchen on site, but it's you by yourself. Mm. So if you're not used to that, <laughs> you know. With no radio. Hard. Yeah, mm. exactly. I'm walking through for quality control and, ooh, is that a broken piece of billionaire's bacon? We can't put that out. I, I'll, I'll have that, you know, right? <laughs> um, and there, there are a few families, there are a few properties that I know of in the United States where it is a full team. There's an executive chef, there's two sous chefs, there's kitchen helpers, but that's not your first role. No, that's, well, that's also, yeah. that. that's 1% of the jobs that are in private service mm -hmm. are that well-structured. And Latricia and I have talked about this countless times is, you know, she loves those offices that have that larger structure and an established hierarchy, but, they're a small percentage mm. of the high net worth homes that are out there uh, when we're looking at everything. And there, there in is that issue. And I've always tell when principals come to me and ask me about chef placement, one of the things I tell them is that just to make sure that they have the occasional event or that, you know, some principals like to put in a no moonlighting clause, meaning you can't do work outside of our thing because we want you available 24 seven for chef roles. I tend to discourage that because of that creativity stifling that can happen. You got to let that chef go out and spread their wings and, you know, just go wild with their creativity. And if you don't, to everyone's point, you're going to lose that chef. The chef's going to go say, you know what? I'd rather take a pay cut, go back into the kitchens where I'm having fun and I'm yelling and we're, mm -hmm. you know, we're having a great time and, you know, we're cursing at each other, playing jokes with each other, getting along. Can't do that in private service because again, it's you and only you and you're in the heart of the home. You're in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So, Every principal is going to come through that area while you're working. Every child is going to go through that area. Every probably every household staff member is coming through. And the dog. So there are people you're working around, but <laughs> they're not the coworkers. Mm -hmm. They're not your friends. You know, they are the the clients. You have to be respectful, absolutely. And I think that's the other part that can be very difficult if you're not experienced in this industry. Is that oh, the principal comes through, you want to engage. You want to talk to them. Well, mm -hmm. there's mistake number one. Give them their food. If they engage with you, you can have live answer, but you need to, you know, you're, they're not there for you to engage with. Right. So, but digressing to getting into it, Latricia and Philip are both right. Photos, menus. You want the job? You know, show us photos. Show us what you're able to plate. Um, wow the customer. Also, when you're going for those trials, don't try to wow the customer. Give them what they want. Mm -hmm. Again, don't try to create this big, beautiful plating artistry if you're going into a job that that's not what the family is. You do that and they're going to say this is beautiful, but not the right chef for us because we want home style cooking. We want family style plates, not works of art every night. Yeah. You know what job I think? Nuts traveling chefs 
mm. traveling chef mm. is just yeah. nuts. So like I've got friends that are traveling chefs and like they'll be going to a villa in Hawaii or wherever and they'll arrive two hours before the family and they have to somehow find the property, find the kitchen, see what's in it, clean it, find a mm-hmm. supermarket, find in food in a different language, get back and his family arrive and like, where's our meal? Like, and then the family's like, oh, our friends are going to come over tonight. I'm like, how does a traveling chef? Firstly, mm-hmm. by the way, I think I'm an aura chef. So I think the role of a chef is mad. And as you sort of said earlier, because it's not just cooking. When you're a private chef, it's everything from beginning to end and everything in between. You're often cooking for the staff as well. Um, and I think it's a mad job. I think it's a mad job. I think it's a h- really hard job. But you throw in you traveling and you're expected to head off to China and have dinner on the table for eight people within an hour. It's just like, I, yeah. I don't know. I think it's, I think it's, I, I think it's such a I, I can good give chef. You, I've been in awe of good chefs. I can give you one, two fun examples here. Uh-huh. Uh, one time I started my day at 5 a.m. getting the chat ready and we were leaving. Uh, at the same time, we were supposed to have lunch at the next destination, which was after a three hour flight. So you do the math, we probably arrived around 9.30 and I still had to do shopping and stuff. Had lunch mm-hmm. ready by 12. And then I was told we're having a small party at night uh, <laughs> where, where like the closest eight people are coming over. I'm like, okay. And, and the day kind mm-hmm. of ended for me after 17 hours, you know, without mm-hmm. a thank you or anything. And so you just like mm-hmm. kind of silently, silently go back to your bed because you know, they're still mm-hmm. having a good time. <laughs> And, mm, yeah. And crawl back to your bed on your hands and knees because you can't walk anymore. You've been <laughs> you've been going all day. It, it, it's a tough it's it's in a very, very tough role. It's mm. a it's also a role that is it is probably one of the more unsecure ones because from my experience, when when markets start to go down when costs need to be cut, the first thing to go is the chef because I've got a house manager that can make basic food or I've got a nanny that can cook for the kids or we can do DoorDash, you know, we can do prepped meals from, from we can find a, a personal chef like Latricia was saying, mm. and deliver meals three times a week. Mm. We don't need the full-time private chef. So they're the first ones to get cut. But you guys um, are really selling in the our private industry. chef jobs here. <laughs> I know. Hey, we want to show the everything. realities. Yeah. We want to show everything because, you know, it's important, I, I think, yeah. to to understand fully what you're getting into, to shine amongst other candidates that are looking to move from restaurant to the private chef world, I would say know your numbers, right? Budgeting is vastly different working in a restaurant versus working in a private home. Um, but still, you should be able to show your cost savings and show, you know, you're getting the best deals. You know, uh, A1, was it A1 Kobe beef? Is A1 Kobe beef, the price is the price, yeah. right? But if you can show that for example, cooking for cooking for the staff, the, one of the first families I worked for, um, we had a chef and we had family meal once a week. And then, you know, when it was right before the 2000, what was it, 2008, 2009 recession in the States? And, you know, we were all we were all charged with, can you bring the numbers down? Yeah, sure. Um, and, you know, looking at how, you know, how do you still create a staff meal with two proteins, a vegetarian option, a salad, dessert, three sides? There's the water, the sodas, all the things that go with that um, and bring the price down for 20 people. And we actually were able to show how we did that, which is great. But beyond beyond the, you know, present preparing and presenting great food, it's the numbers. It's the fact that you're doing all the shopping. How do you work with that to, to make all that happen? Um, most chefs walk in and all the stuff is there when you work in a restaurant. You have to source everything when you're a chef, right? Yeah. Whether you're going to be on their private yacht, whether you're going to be in their winter home, if you're traveling with them to the urban condo, you, you have to so, you have to be able to source all the food, all the ingredients. So that's something most restaurant chefs, I would say, don't do on a daily basis. And those are you actually, know what that is? So, oh, sorry. Yeah. So those are actually very interesting conversation to have. Like I, I've been there where my principal told me to cut costs, but at the same time I asked him like, so um, you're eating caviar every second day, you still want to eat caviar? And you know, you're having Dover sole almost every lunch from the grill, which is like $40 a fish. You sit, would you still like to eat that? And he's like, yes. And then I'm like, okay, 
Uh, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to cut the cost on buying cheaper Cheerios mm -hmm. for the kids. Like it's, right. it's mm -hmm. in those items where I can make an actual difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. A minute ago, you were like, we're not really selling the role of a private chef, but I want to flip that and be like, there is, I've, I've got some amazing stories. So like some experiences these chefs have are so cool. And like, I've spoke to some yes. chefs that have had the most mad few years doing amazing stuff. So don't get me wrong. Obviously, it's really good to highlight how difficult it is and the challenge you'll have. But once you know what you're doing, you've nailed it. It's super cool. My brother is a house manager for a billionaire, quite a high profile billionaire. He was telling me, and it's, it's not confident, you won't mind me saying, he was telling me that the chef, his boss loves beef, right? And his boss said to his chef, I want you, I will pay you to go around the world for an entire year and find me the best beef. So he got himself another chef for a year to take over. And this chef traveled What? the world for a year, right? Anyway, decided actually in Texas, he found a ranch in Texas that he said, this is the best steak, right? So the principal bought the ranch, right, there and then. And now, this is a couple of years ago, every single piece of beef that passes this man's lips is from his ranch in Texas, hmm. mental. But this chef got to travel in the world, went to all the countries you can imagine, to try the steak and found the ranch for the man to buy. And even now, my brother was saying to me that um, he, uh, this man has a, a house in London and a house up in Oxford. So in a car, it's like an hour and a half, but of course he helicopters between the two. And he decided one day that he wanted a burger. I, think, I don't know which house he was at, um, but the, his big green egg barbecue was at the wrong house. So they sent a helicopter to pick up a steak and the big green egg barbecue to fly it back to the burger. It's probably about a 40 grand burger. No, more than that, because it's from his, the beef was from his ranch in Texas. So the beef had come over from Texas, the helicopter, br anyway. So, but the so ships, awesome. when you've got, when you've got principles that are foodies and are, and have, and don't care about the money, you can get sent on all sorts of cool missions to get to source the coolest product on oh, the jets and cops. The perks and benefits are, are fabulous. I'm, again, yeah, I'm not a chef, but I've worked with some really great chefs. The fact that they go, we really like the food at, insert, you know, trendy restaurant. You and the chef should go and taste the food, do a whole thing, and then see what they can replicate for us here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. And so you, great, you get to have these beautiful meals, right? Wine included, because they want you to be able to replicate mm -hmm. that meal or um, the aspects of those meals for them at their home and for their guests. The, the other way that usually happens, I usually go, we could do that, or we can just call, you know, Nubu and get a chef to come out for a day or two. <laughs> you know? Well, I was just going to say, I've seen, I've, seen that, I've seen that before. I've seen Nubu restaurant close completely. The entire team get flown to a Middle Eastern country for a week yeah. and spend a week with their kitchen, with their kitchen staff yeah. for a week and then fly back and reopen the restaurant. They literally close the restaurant for a week. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. And the fact that you get to travel the world at, at that mm. level, you know, that you mm. fly with them or you fly mm. ahead of them. Usually we fly the chefs in before the family. You know, I'll help I'll help a chef get the shopping and the things mm. ordered and provisions and things like that. Um, they usually fly in a day or two ahead, especially when doing a lot of dinner parties. I want the chef on ground and rested mm. <laughs> before the family gets here. I'll put some security boards together. Don't worry, we'll be fine. Mm. Um, But then they fly back with the family. So you're, you know, mm. you're flying back on private, you know, private jets and, and doing, mm. doing all that. So the perks are wonderful, but getting in and understanding that nine times out of 10, it's just you, you know, mm. I think people really need to understand what that means when they come from working in a kitchen with a team. Well, I think that's, that's the important part where we're in. Well, I just wanted to say that like, to your point, Hannes, about, you know, it sounds like we're, you know, say you're trying to discourage it and and that's not it i i see one of my jobs is to to shine the light on the darker corners yeah. mm -hmm. you know you're yes these chefs are coming in they have these rose colored glasses on because they've heard about this industry and they've heard all the fun stories that philippa and latricia were just sharing they've heard them but what they haven't heard are the obstacles that they're going to face. And I do believe that, and I do this with uh, my candidates as well with, with positions is, I'm going to do a little bit of devil's advocacy and try to talk you out of it. Because mm. if I can show you the true negatives and you know the obstacles, they're no longer a surprise to you when you're there and you can overcome them much easier. That's what's 
setting someone up for success is showing them everything, not just the the super cool, fun stuff of traveling the world to pick out the perfect steak. And of mm. course they wind up here in Texas. I mean, <laughs> it, it makes complete perfect sense. I'll be there at least. Um, I'll be there at least. For me, absolutely. But there's also, you know, the challenges are going to far outweigh those those fun times that you experience and you got to be ready for them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I used to joke that uh, moving from a restaurant into a private service is going from like physical warfare to psychological warfare. You know, a lot of it is actually mm. a mental game and that that you yeah. really have to prepare it for that part. So if, if, if a chef made it through the first 20 minutes of this episode, you know, uh, you've discouraged them plentiful and now we can speak about the positive aspects. <laughs> so where do you see this industry moving? Like we, even just in the last five to 10 years, the landscape has shifted a lot. You know, we're in the early 2024 period right now on the conference. We've already kind of seen how the landscape has shifted. I think the traditional service and butler model is kind of slowly phasing out. People are more into the California style kind of um, service than they are into the London days one. Where do you see trends moving? Where do you think people can upskill to better position themselves for new positions with uh, families that are coming to wealth now? I think after COVID, things took a bit of a nosedive because I think principals are expecting people to do more, more variety of stuff. I think they were quite used during lockdown having a skeletal team that could sort of do everything. And they came out of that and still expected house managers to do everything. To be fair, I think they were, I don't, that was coming less of a thing now. These hybrid roles and all that crap people did for a bit. I feel they're coming out of that again now. So I do feel that, as I say, we had anyway, families wanting a few people in the house trying to do everything and it's that's starting to change for the good for the better um and i think principles uh are some of, some of our principles are starting to realize that that, that will have a knock-on effect on the level of service you get it doesn't necessarily save you money either because you've got a turnover of staff um, and actually now we are now finding well how, the word hybrid isn't really spoken about really with us now people are very happy to have a house manager and a chef and a nanny which is as it should be rather than one person two or three yeah and the industry i don't know about you guys anyway but um but it's so busy at the minute like sort of like super thriving i i meet up with quite a lot of my competitors in uh, london we're called it the good agency club i went out to loads of my competitors and i was like should we hang out And the bigger agencies didn't reply to me because they um, don't think that you should talk to each other. But the smaller major, or some, a lot of the agencies were like, this is so cool. So there's 10 of us now, 10 of us competing agencies. And we meet once a quarter and we drink some wine and we put the world to rights. And we try and sort of like unite and like have a few agreements where we work a certain way and all the rest is super cool. And all of us were sort of saying that like, for us, December was terrible. January was my worst month on record. But then over the last sort of like six weeks, it's been mad, 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 mad busy. And we've got like nice clients with good roles, paying well. It's just feeling healthy at the moment, having had months in the past of low-balling candidates, mucking people around, pulling offers, paying below market rate. I don't know what it's like with other people doing what you're doing at the moment, Peter, but I'm just finding, or maybe we're just getting more ruthless at who we choose to work with. But the, at the minute, the roles that seem to be coming through just seem to be decent with decent clients. So... So for my side, like I'm feeling really positive about the industry at the moment. Absolutely. I, I mean, I'm very positive about the industry. I've seen an upswing just, just this year. Mm. Now, I have a bit of a contrary belief um, about the whole hybrid role thing than Philippa does. I do believe that hybrid roles are, are here. They're not going anywhere. Mm. We're, we're they, the only way that um, they're, they're going to go anywhere is it you know, really is with a shift in the generation that is in the family office right now. Now, hybrid roles are okay within reason. I mean, if yes, you cannot be a chef and mind the kids and run the home of a 15,000 square foot home with three kids. No, you cannot do that. Um, and you're having to cook meals every day. But if it's a hybrid role where you're only cooking two or three times a week and there's no kids and it is a 8,000, 6,000 square foot home with just Mr. and Mrs., well, that's achievable. That is, that's manageable. So 
all have to, you know, we have to look at all the criteria that go into those hybrid roles. Yeah. If you've got, again, you, you have meet that certain criteria. It's like, well, no, no human can operate at that level and sustain their happiness and your comfort and luxury at that level. If you want that level of service, you absolutely have to break it out into different roles. Right. If you just want stuff on a plate, you know, edible food, you're not that you don't want the fufu high art and, and everything, and you're willing to eat leftovers, it's a cha- attainable. But if those standards are set too high, yeah, no, you're not, nobody is ever going to succeed. And also, by the way, you want those standards, you want that, it's not going to change the dollar amount to fill up this point. You're going to have to pay that private chef much more to do all that stuff, or you can spread that money out between other staff members to lighten the load and create a better environment. So it's about all the factors but I don't see hybrid positions going away anytime soon, especially with the the high net worth market, not really the very high net worth or the ultra high net worth markets. Those will stay fairly separate roles because of demands. But when the just the high net worth market, you're going to always see hybrid positions out there. It's about balancing the workload and making it fair. So, Peter, since... Since you just said that, um, maybe you can make a distinction. So a chef who has no idea about, like, well, what does it mean to work for somebody who just have money versus somebody who has a lot of money to fly private versus somebody who has multiple chats and multiple estates and like 40, 40 people involved in just his private life to service them. Sorry for the interruption, but we got to share the news with you. Nothing fishy from FultonFishMarket.com. They're delivering world-class seafood from New York City's legendary Fulton Fish Market straight to your door. Their fishmongers have helped countless chefs get what they need when they need it for over 200 years. Trusting FultonFishMarket.com means their experts work tirelessly to make your day run smoothly. Let your cooking skills shine and elevate your dishes with amazing seafood from FultonFishMarket.com. I, you say, what's it like? Can you define? Yeah, the distinction. I'm, I'm not sure I understand the distinction. The so let, let's say again, I'm I'm a new chef coming from a restaurant. Like um, for me, they're all rich, but there is a there is a difference in those level of riches that will make a difference in my experience of working for them. I have an Patricia, answer. go for it. I have an answer for this for you, Hannes. So there are strata to wealth, right? Yeah. So the way I usually explain it to uh, my colleagues and candidates, because I'm also a resume writer and career coach for the for the industry, is so a family where one or both make over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, right? A couple, they can usually they usually have a cleaning service, right? Yeah. They have somebody who comes in once a week takes care of things. Um, they might have someone who comes in daily to take care of things. At some point, they have children, and so they they you know they're they're moving up in wealth. They're making more money. They have someone who can take care of the children. Is that you know part time, full time? That changes things. Once you can have a a full time housekeeper, a full time nanny who comes in for you know up to upwards of forty hours a week, and a chef, that's a different strata. That's not someone who's having a personal chef just cook meals off site and drop off to them. Someone who's cooking for you and shopping for you and preparing food for you five days a week. week to feed you seven, that's different. Once you can have a driver, you're literally paying someone to sit around and wait for you to move from point A to point B. That's a different strata, right? Because yeah. that's a different level of money. Having a NetJets membership versus having your own plane and owning your own FBO, FBO is a different strata of money. So the more money usually means an established family office some some formality you described it as the london versus the california yeah look at, at some level there's going to be structure and the structure is necessary and needed that usually comes with more money more properties to to drag it out to have consistency across all venues for the all properties for the family it's very different than just walking into a family just that owns a really nice house you know in a nice part of town hmm. it's, it's vastly different usually more money more formality Or at least on paper, they might still be cool California Baja taco people, but, <laughs> but the fact that their home, like the first family I worked for, had two catering kitchens on property, and a, and the family kitchen. So the family kitchen, they could tool around do what they want, but right next door to that was a completely stainless steel kitchen for the chef to bang out meals in quick, right? And then 
further away on property was a huge stainless steel kitchen for all the things that the chef had to do for the property, you know, for family meal, for staff, for investor meetings, for philanthropic, you know, fundraisers. And so that's the difference, right? If you're cooking in the same kitchen that Mrs. is coming to make her tea in, vastly different to go, oh, she's in her kitchen doing whatever, because I'm over there cranking out, you know, a fundraising cocktail event, you know, that's going to start in four hours. So, you know, the strata is different. I started with a formal family, lots of staff, lots of properties. And so that's what I gravitate toward. I like it. I like it. Um, if, if that might not be the first move for everyone, it might be coming into a home that is a couple or a couple maybe starting their family and, and, and slowly moving up and having more responsibilities. It depends on the individual, their experience and what they want. Latricia has excellently put uh, and described because it, it's tough to, yes, we can go in and, and, and pull the numbers as to what certain wealth managers can classify high net worth versus very high net worth versus ultra high net worth. But uh, I think Latricia illustrates it even better that it's about family dynamic, mm -hmm. but it's also there's a job for everybody mm -hmm. out there. Whether you want super formal and you want to create those beautiful pieces of art that you do, or you just want, you know, you want to be on a ranch and you want to cook the hunting spoils of the, you know, of the day uh, for the family. You want to just be in California and cook hyper specialized macro keto diets for someone who, um, you know, is a model or actress or actor. The variety of positions in our industry are as various as the personalities that employ us. Yeah. There is a job for everybody. It's going to take a while to find, and you're going to have to do a lot of work to get that job. Some of these jobs can months go by to get them. You got to do trials, but you know, you'd follow Latricia's and Philippa's recommendations of setting up those profiles. You know, you got to have photos. You got to have the menus. You demonstrate. You're putting yourself ahead of the game, but also know what it is, know you, know what it is that you want to cook, know what kind of environment you want to be in. And then when you make that decision, you also have to know how that decision impacts your job search. If you, the more you narrow down what it is that you want and who you want to work for, your, your job pool shrinks. So you go from fishing in an ocean to fishing in a lake, to fishing in a pond, to fishing in a pool, you know, in a swimming pool. Is this something uh, that so you appreciate if more. somebody comes to you with very clear idea? I'm like, this is who I am. This is who I want to work for. Um, you know, if you have a good fit, please reach out to me. Is that something you appreciate over somebody who's highly scared yeah, and open I, to more opportunity? No, I, I like people that know what they want. Correctly? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, bit, it's a bit the same with principles. I like it. I like it when a principal says to me, gives me a list this long of what they do and don't want. I can work with that. I hate it when a principal says to me, just find me someone that's really nice, that's going to get on with it, that's going to turn up. And I'm like, but I can. That gets it. That gets it. Yeah, tell me someone that gets it. And I'm like, just, yeah, but what do you, but what do you want? Well, I don't know what I, don't know what I want, but I don't, uh, the same with candidates. I, I hate candidates say to me, I'll do anything. I was like, well, I don't, where do I start? I want you to be really clear with what you want. And obviously if they don't know what they want. That's fair enough. But like, uh, yeah. And um, I don't know if this is a much of a thing in the US, but what's another really good thing for chefs breaking the industry in Europe is to do seasons. So go do a villa, go work in a villa for the summer in Ibiza or go work in a ski chalet in Cordova for the winter. Benefit with that is the employers are much, uh, are quite happy to give chefs from good restaurants the opportunity. And it's a good opportunity for the chef because they'll have a different family every single week. So in the space of an 18-week season, you've cooked for 18 different families. And that's a super fast track to learn what you like, what you don't like, can't bear kids, love kids, like don't like the younger generation, but whatever. And you've had a, such a – it doesn't matter you like them. They're in and out within a week. And that's a really good thing um, to be able to experience. It's, the season goes super quick. It's really fun. It's very, very intense, but you learn loads about yourself, mm -hmm. about how to be a private chef. It's a very much sink or swim situation. And I sort of say to people, do a summer season. 
followed by a winter season. That's 12 months private chefing immediately. And you've learned loads during that time. I don't know if that's so much of a thing out in the US doing seasonal work, but um, yeah, I think that can be, can be super helpful. I think this sounds actually like the best way to not get fired or uh, quit a lot mm -hmm. and have that kind of exposure to that many families, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It is good. It is intense. And for some reason, uh, especially in the ski industry, they tend to get like a load of kids in to do the seasonal work. And I'm like, and then they get really annoyed because these kids just want to go skiing all the time and get drunk all the time. I was like, well, pay a bit more and get some professional people. And you want to have those issues. A lot of the recruitment we do is for the luxury end. So we don't sort of have that. But um, yeah, I know people that sort of go out to a ski season. They've done 16 seasons back to back and it's all they want to do because they love being in the mountains with different families each week. They don't really want to commit to one family. They can't they really know which one they want to do. But um, yeah, uh, just, a, just a, diff a different angle on the whole private chefing. And I always say to people, it's a really, really good way of gaining experience. And then all of a sudden you get one or two years private chefing experience and you know what you're talking about. And then it kind of like, you know, decide which path you want to take. Peter, um, where, where do we have those seasonal jobs? So we definitely have the Florida winter. We have the summer in the Hamptons. Uh, we have the yeah. Aspen season. Um, where mm -hmm. else do we have strong seasonality where somebody could pick up this experience in the States? Um, our Northern States, uh, Sun Valley, the Sun Valley is a big one. Oh, yeah. Um, Jacksonville, uh, you know, looking at those ski areas, but even you look at, uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, and, you know, some of those areas, even though the Northern, uh, New York, um, in addition to the Hamptons, but also the, the Poconos, those, feels, any of those mountainous yeah. regions. Mm -hmm. I don't see as many seasonal positions um, no, I don't in, come across in the United States no. as, as one might see in Europe because it's not as as common. Most of the principles that, you know, oh, we're going out to Sun Valley, I, we're taking our chef with us yeah. mm -hmm. or we're taking our house manager with us because he's he and he can cook good food and, and take care of us you know i think that it is it, it's about that dynamic skill set but the, not a whole bunch of seasonality yes we have seasons but mm, americans are seem to be a bit more resistant to letting a stranger into their home to come and cook for them mm -hmm. they want a trusted individual mm -hmm. yeah but, but it's like that in the end it's slightly different because the properties in Europe, they're rental properties. So again, it's not like a yep. it's not like a family having them for the season. It's um, it's more like a company that's operating a property that's being sold as holidays. Um, but yeah, I, I I definitely do not see it in the US at all, like I do over here. Um, mm -hmm. um yeah, it's a nice so it's a nice life for, for candidates because you get to live the summer season followed by you know snow sun snow sun. It's it's a nice way to live. Yeah, you get yeah, to you I, get to be um, where it's fun. Like yeah, yeah. exactly. What I've seen more of if the family's going to, if they don't bring their chef for the entire time they're in the Hamptons or the entire time they're in the French West Indies, then they will work with a local restaurant that they patronize all the time or a local catering firm that we use all the time to say, hey, where well, are we in town? A couple of nights, we're going to do dinners, but we just want to have, you know, they pay for the, the, the caterers, one or two small team people to come in and work with mm. us. Yeah. So what are some of the red flags for a candidate? Actually, so first let's speak about red flags that you would disqualify a candidate and then red flags that candidates should look out for when they go on trial. Actually, I can. I, so for me, the, on the principal side, it is a one, your private service professionals in the United States are W-2 employees. They're not 1099 contractors. Mm -hmm. No, not even the chefs. You are a W-2 employee. So if they not put in, if employers don't put them on W-2, we won't represent them. Um, if you're underpaying in your salary or over demands in your ask, we won't represent them. And if you are, we notice that there is some character issues with the principal or a high, super high turnover rate, we'll say, Thank you very much, but our plate is full. Um, mm -hmm. As far on the candidate side, it's, you know, to your point before about having a candidate come to you knowing what they want, that is amazing. Yes. But it's also in the delivery. And if you become too rigid and you're like, oh, this is the only thing I'm going to take and, and your delivery is poor or you're not, 
listening or paying attention to the details. So the details matter. If we have a, we have a very specific methodology for bringing our candidates into our system and it's outlined. And if you don't follow it, I have, it brings up doubts about your attention to detail. It brings up doubts about your um, capabilities of communicating and following through, you know, so these are issues, but also the back to what we said in the very beginning, the chef ego has to stay at the door because if those kids want dino nuggets and, and craft mac and cheese, that's what they're getting. I've turned away chefs who's, oh, I'm not going to cook that. Okay. Well, there's the door because the kid, that's what the kids want. Yeah. So, or I have to step in. Fine. I'll make the craft mac and cheese and the dino nuggets. But at the end of the dinner, you might as well go ahead and pack your bags because mm -hmm. you won't be here tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think similar to that. I just think you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. So if you're a chef looking for work, think about how you are conducting yourself right from the very early stages. Think about your how you're communicating with an agency or with the employer directly. Obviously, I only know from the agency side. The amount of people that like, it's not that difficult. It's very, very common sense, but they mess up all the time. You need to be well presented. You need to be, I need to be able to get hold of you. The amount of resumes I get without phone numbers on it, like all that email addresses. I've got some, like, not so much now, but when I first sat my age about 10 years ago, I'd have candidates that would be giving me their mum's phone number because they haven't got a phone Just like, get your dogs, have a suitable email address. I don't want like sexychick69 at gmail.com like, or whatever. Have an appropriate email address. Think about where you're, how you're presenting yourself. Think about how you're speaking with me. Think about, as you said before, what it is that you want and how you deliver that. I need to be able to get a hold of you. And don't ghost me. People think, mm. people moan all the time on LinkedIn about ghost, uh, recruiters ghosting them. Candidates are way worse. Way, 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 way worse. We get ghosted all day long. And it's even when they're like mid-interview, like I'll have a lovely conversation. They've seen a couple of our old. I've put them forward. The client wants an interview. I never hear from them again. Or they have an interview and they hear from them again. So just keep that line of communication open. Be really respectful. Don't be rude. Like, be humble. I'll never, I don't get out of bed for less than 150 grand. I just think you're a dickhead. Like, it's, it could be, do you know what I mean? So, bye bye. Yeah, just think about, <laughs> yeah. think about who you're speaking to and don't be Mr. Big Bollocks. Like, I hate that, uh, uh, that ego. Um, there mm -hmm. are lots of good chefs out there, buddy. I always say it's everyone is replaceable. Even I, if I get hit by bus tomorrow, Silver Swan probably won't fold. So another, my husband will put another MD in. Like, all of us are replaceable. So be grateful and appreciative of people's time and the opportunities and don't waste them. And, you know what I mean, make the most of it. We're only sort of here once, do you know what I mean? But, yeah, when it comes to sort of job hunting, and also take it seriously. Don't, don't apply to everything. Take your time. Quality mm -hmm. over quantity. Be thorough and be detailed. Um, and, yeah. And also, like, it's really important that people like you. Be likeable. I, like the chefs that I like, I'll prioritize, I'll remember you, you know, I'll think about you when I'm talking to X, Y, Z client. If you piss me off, like I'm just not bothered because there's a million other chefs looking for work. Like even if you got to fake it, like suck up, whatever you got to do, like you need people to like you, you need people to want to help you and promote you. Doing And also for us as well, like if we've got a brand new client, a really cool role, I'm only going to put people forward that I trust is going to pre represent us well. I'm not going to take a risk on a cowboy chef who's already let me down twice on various other things. I'm only going to put my trust in chefs that have been brilliant from the beginning. So yeah, just, and all this stuff is super, super straightforward. And everyone's like, of course, of course, of course. But you'd be so surprised how many candidates like are just, uh, just make so many mistakes during this process. Yeah. You agree, Latricia? I think, yeah. I think the biggest mistake that uh, candidates make during a trial is not realizing that everyone you interact with in that family mm -hmm. were coming to them for their their insights on how it is to work with you. Um, like Peter said earlier, the housekeeping staff is there to clean up after the family, not after you. So when mm -hmm. I do work trials with chefs, I'm looking for how do you leave this kitchen when you're done at the end of your shift? It means mm -hmm. I'm staying here at nine o'clock at night to walk through that kitchen. If it's nasty, I, yeah, I, mm -hmm. that, that doesn't work. And most chefs aren't doing cleanup in restaurants, right? They're, they're tidying up a, a, a station, but they're not scrubbing down a kitchen and scrubbing down a kitchen floor that because it's this type of wood or this type of stain or this type of stone has to only be cleaned a certain way. Um, so that's part of it. Everyone you interact with is we're coming back to them for their input on how it is to work with you and move around the space with you. Um, 
I think that's the biggest one for me because I, I will always ask the housekeepers because they're back and forth all day through the kitchen and the laundry room area is how are they? Yeah, <laughs> are they asking me to do things for them? Well, you know what's going on, and and knowing that sometimes as a chef I might walk in and go, so chef I'm going to need one of your burners for a few minutes. I need to you know I got a sick dog. I need to put together just like you know a nice chicken breast <laughs> with whatever for a puppy, and to not get a you know not get a strange reaction on that. Sometimes we're 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 putting together meals for pets <laughs> mm-hmm. or we're putting together, you know, strange requests. Or if you put to, not reacting negatively is the biggest. I've had chefs that when we, you know, we're having a, we're having a party specifically to see how they can handle preparing and executing, you know, a party. And, you know, the chef will put in the kitchen refrigerator or something and it's not properly labeled. So the kids go in and go, Woo-hoo! stuffed mm-hmm. what tomatoes, lovely. And the tray disappears. And you, you know, the chef goes, you know, reacts really badly to the fact that a tray of, you know, hors d'oeuvres has disappeared. Well, one, it needs to be properly labeled. And two, this is how it happens here. I'm sorry. Mm. You have to scrounge something up to, to, to make that particular platter, you know, be full or we'll scratch it entirely. But how you react to things that happen, because in a home, someone's going to walk in the kitchen and go, oh my God, I'm starving. This is great. And walk off. Yeah. And, and be, be clean. Like you've got to be clean. You've got to smell. You can't smell. Like you've got to be a well-presented, clean chef, and you need to work cleanly. It's someone's mm-hmm. home and they're there all the time. You can't like you can't cook like I cook. Like where you've got like use everything and everything there. You need to be really mindful that that place is still someone's home, even mid shift. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you a funny curveball that happened to me once. I came for a trial that was in London, actually but it was for a New York based family and they flew me into London. And then they told me like on the way to, to London that they will also have a party for 120 people at the same night at the house. And that I'm basically mm-hmm. cooking after the party and I'll be sharing the kitchen with the chefs who cater the party. And I'm like, okay, this is interesting, <laughs> but you know, you just have to go with it. Yeah. And th- these things as well, I think I'm often there to test you just to sort of see not even so much as like how you manage it, like, from a chefing point of view, how you manage it, like um, um, emotionally and mentally. And like I say, don't be, always react positively with the company they always work for. They always said, the answer is always yes. The answer is yes. What's the question? So that needs to be your attitude. Of course, of course, of course. You'll figure it out separately. But of course, of course, of course. What do you want? That's fine. No problem. Obviously, you need to come back with a different option. Fair enough. But um, you can't be turning around and be like, no, no, never going to work. Not a million years. No way. It just needs to very much be very positive and of course, and easy all the time. Yeah, my personal. Oh, well, yeah. If you're if you're constantly negative about about things, all of a sudden people stop asking you mm. for things, and they stop correcting things. So if you're responding negatively, or not even negatively, but uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, <laughs> The ladies of the house feel that, and now they're no longer going to tell you that they didn't like this temp or that veggie or this dish. Mm. They're just going to eventually stop communicating, and all of a sudden, you're going to be terminated because they're finding someone new because the principal's not comfortable coming to you with you for stuff. Right. Because every time you do, you respond, you roll your eyes, or here we go again. Mm. Again, it is... It's such a highly specialized industry and personal industry that, you know, you're, you're on. Mm. And, you know, the, the thing I always say is don't stop putting your best foot forward. Don't put your best foot forward in the interview. Do it every day. Mm. Do it in every action. Do it with every, with chefs. Do it with every meal. When you go for the interview, be who you are. Be your genuine uh, professional self because that's who they're going to hire and that's who they're going to trust. But if you try to put on that best foot forward and no, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm this, but in the back of my mind, I'm grumbling, then you're, you're only going to be able to keep up that facade for about five, six, seven months. And then it's going to drop and they're going to be asking, who is this person? I don't remember hiring this individual and trust immediately starts to degrade because of that. So, and I think that's across the board, you know, dealing with us agencies, dealing with the principals, it's a bit of better if it's with us agencies. I get it. Sometimes you need somebody to vent, mm-hmm. but if all I'm hearing is venting, yeah. 
Mm. Mm. Okay. You're, where's the common denominator now? Well, if your brain is always going negative, there's no positivity flowing from it. You're the ladies of the house feel that energy and are going to be wondering what's wrong. Mm. You know, one person yeah. take on this is also, I always feel like be somebody who solves problems and makes things happen. Like the minute you're part of creating problems or issues or dis discomfort simply because pe other people have to think more because you're not picking it up. I think it's actually the, the end of your role be because we are there to solve problems and make things happen and create wonderful experiences on a daily basis. Yeah, is that like 100% agree. So um, I, I think we actually wrapped it all up very nicely as far as what it takes for, to go from zero to one. And there's a lot of soft skill in this, which obviously we just can't teach in, in a session like that. But uh, thank you all so much for your time. And um, if there's anything else you would like to add, you know, shoot away, it's kind of open floor now. Um, I'll just finish by saying, I think that it's so much more than just being a really good chef. And if you don't worry, if you're not the best chef, make up for it by being the best employee, the easiest person to work with, the nicest guy, the nicest mm. girl. That can carry you so far. And I think so many families would rather a lesser chef who's a really great positive part of the team. So don't stress if you don't think that your resume is as strong as your mates or whatever. Make up for it in other areas. And I, I actually think, I think personality and attitude and work ethic will carry you further than how many stars you've ever done, etc. So, yeah. I like that. Yep. And, and I agree. I think so. One... Honest to your point, soft skills have to be intact, a hundred percent. Also, no, and and if you're struggling with that, then reach out. There are people like myself and Latricia that provide coaching to help with that those soft skills. But also, you know, be dynamic. It expand mm. to Philippa's point. Being an excellent chef is fantastic, but it's just one small component of the larger job. Knowing some household management, knowing um, how to document an inventory according to a household, not according to the, the restaurant business, but according to a household, that's critical. And, and also... Your resume needs to be on point and it needs to be private service, not restaurant corporate. For those kinds of things, you've got to talk to people like Latricia. Um, so that way your resume, when it comes to people like myself or Philippa, it's Oh, it's telling me what I need to know. I'm not having to guess. But if you send me a restaurant resume, a corporate resume, now I'm having to decipher what's transferable and what's not. You speak to someone like Latricia, she's going to format that for you. I'm going to get it and go, I know exactly what you're capable of. I've got, I know exactly where to place you instead of having to make me dig and work for it. So have your ducks in a row. I love that. Thanks. Thanks for that, Peter. I also think two things, networking and your ongoing professional and personal development. Um, whether you're, you're you're trying to transition, you you land that first role, continue to do your stages to continue to learn the new way of cooking things, the new trending way of, you know, paleo, keto, what, whatever the next one is, right? Being able to cook in those realms is always very good. And continue the network. Once you land that job, don't stop talking to chefs. Don't stop talking to recruiters. Uh, if you haven't already, start talking to household managers. Start talking to people in the industry. There are a lot of great resources out there. Don't let anything hinder your ongoing professional development. Because if it's truly a career, then your learning should keep pace with every role that you have. Where are the trends moving right now in terms of dietary restrictions or rather trends what are you seeing in the latest uh, job posts? What, what do families look for right now? I've got two paleo chefs roles at the moment. I don't even know what that is, really. I'm not working <laughs> them. But yeah, paleo, keto, expect every household you work in to have some kind of dietary requirements. Between mum, dad, no grandma and three kids, they will, <laughs> if you're lucky, you'll just have a couple of vegetarians in there, if you're lucky. But generally... They are conscious and mindful of the diets of the children. The wife generally tends to be pretty good. 
he may like you you could be cooking a different meal for each of the four members of the family at each meal time but um i think that if you don't like fussy eaters you should not work in this industry because you'll there will be and i think the diets change all the time um but yeah pa- paleo is very popular at the moment i think it's actually yeah i don't I mean they're, they're, all the diets i think it's it's about being aware of the food allergies mm-hmm. you know it, i think it's even broader than understand no this specific diet this specific diet i think you can dive even deeper in understanding okay well this is a wheat allergy this is how a wheat allergy impacts most people and this is why that kind of that alton brown type of thinking so that way when that next fad comes across which it will Mm -hmm. it will change you know the science behind it and can say oh i see what they're getting at yes mr and mrs smith i can absolutely mimic that diet for you because all it is is this this and this oh wow yeah. you know food right. you know you know food rather than just being able to cook you understand and know foods that's far more important than trying to specify any specific diet that you should be learning about or what the next trend is yeah i agree uh, farm to table is always going to be there. Know that if you've not, if you've never done gardening, uh, most private families, if they have the space for it, there's some gardening going on, and you might be the person in charge of all that. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, I think the nutritional and performance value of it is hot right now for a lot of people. Peter's uh, explanation is perfect. If you can understand the nutritional needs behind the food and how that works, and the allergies and restrictions. And on the other side of that, what's going to really help an athlete or just one of those people who are just high performing all the time to to meet their dietary requirements through what you prepare for them. So summing the whole conversation up, basically your chef needs to be like a Swiss knife. Yep. Pretty much. (laughs) And a nice one. Every private service professional needs to be a Swiss army knife. Now you're not using the tools all the time, but they need to be in your toolkit. And you need to be able to pull them out when you need them. And if you need them all the time, that's when you go back and you have your reviews and start discussing workloads and and everything. Because you are, I think one of the things that we didn't touch on is, yes, you're going on interviews, but at the same time, you're interviewing them. Is this a family you can work for? Are these menus that you want to create day in and day out? Don't take the job because it's there in front of you. Take the job because you want the job and you can see performing, doing this job for the next five to 10 years. Then take the job. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I think it's super important that 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 particular piece aligns. And I think especially from going from zero to one, the first possession seems so a position seems so tempting. It could be the salary, it could be like the change in in everything. But don't fall for it. Like yes, you want the first position, but you also want it to be a good fit. You don't want it to just be the first paycheck and then see that you know they want to eat Chinese and you've never cooked Chinese. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Well, Latricia, Philippa, Peter, thank you so much for making the time. I think this this will be a great resource for so many chefs. And once they kind of got through the first 20 minutes of this, which is very discouraging (laughs) to be a private chef, and they actually stuck with it and they made up their mind to become chefs, where can they connect with you, reach out to you and actually take the first step in possibly landing in a private household? Yeah, for me, just come visit our website, civilsonrecruitment.com. I'm all over LinkedIn. My staff are all over LinkedIn. If you come to the website, then you can come have a conversation with one of our team. Yeah, for me, it's LinkedIn. Connect me on LinkedIn, and then I can interact with you there, share resources, and if you need help with uh, putting together your resume, your portfolio, or get some coaching, I'm there for you. And for us, it's uh, similar to Philippa Smith. We're, you know, we're on online, our website, you know, just Google Estate Management Solutions. You're going to find us. We're on LinkedIn, Meta as well. We, you know, we have a variety of services that will help these chefs make that transition, including a, a career entry program that it takes them step through step from getting their resume tailored to identifying hard skills and 
and really being ready for their first job. So we're we're here and just as accessible as any one of the other amazing people on this panel. Nice. Mm -hmm. And I will also make sure to add all of those to the show notes so that everybody has easy access. And again, thank you so much for your time. I think this has been super insightful and helpful for the next chef looking to get into private. Thank you, everybody. Awesome. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you very much for having us. <laughs> cool. We'd like to thank our sponsor, FultonFishMarket.com, the best seafood in the nation, trusted by the best chefs in the world. Aside from offering premium seafood, they also make life easier for you by delivering all these outstanding products right to your doorstep. Visit the official website, www.FultonFishMarket.com and explore the incredible selection of seafood and let your clients experience quality that has captivated palates for generations. Use code PRIVATECHEF at checkout to get 15% of your first order. When it comes to seafood, FultonFishMarket.com is the name we trust. Thank you for joining us at the Private Chef Podcast. If you know any highly skilled chefs that want to take their life to the next level, make sure to share this podcast with them. And if you enjoyed this episode, click subscribe and check out our upcoming episodes. Thank you for listening.